And that's nice to know because that means even if you happen not to remember the electronegativity of carbon and the electronegativity of oxygen, you'll know that when you have a bond between carbon and oxygen, the oxygen has a partial negative charge. The oxygen is delta negative. The dipole points from carbon to oxygen. Now remember, we saw this trend of as you go up the alkali metals, our electronegativity increases. And that's the same in the halogen. That's the beauty of the periodic table. You have trends that really pervade. So as we go from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine, your numbers go 3.4.0 for fluorine, 3.2 for chlorine, 3.0 for bromine, and 2.7 for iodine. <coughs> I'll throw in one more element. As I said, I mean, I could throw in boron, which is of some relevance, phosphorus, which is of some relevance. I'll throw in just one more that you'll encounter this, uh, this academic year, and actually we'll encounter later in today's talk. So sulfur is 2.6. Again, this trend, as you go up, you go increasing electronegativity as you go from sulfur to oxygen. All right, let's take, let's take these numbers and that idea we talked about last time of ionic bonds having an electronegativity difference of greater than about 2 and covalent bonds less than about 2 and nonpolar covalent bonds having a sort of less than 0.5. Let's take a look at some chemical compounds. So let's start with some simple stuff that you'd see in G-chem. Hydrogen fluoride we've talked about before. Just about as polar as you can get. Hydrogen is 2.2. Fluorine is 4.0. So we have a big molecular di dipole, well, a big bond dipole, which in the case of hydrogen fluoride happens to be the same as the molecular dipole because it's diatomic, pointing from fluorine from hydrogen to fluorine. This is just the same concept that we said last time, that we have our delta negative on fluorine and our delta positive on hydrogen. We looked at carbon dioxide last time. Let's take a look at it in light of our electronegativity numbers. So we said carbon was 2.5, oxygen was 3.4. And so you have bond dipoles pointing from carbon to oxygen. What about the molecule itself? Is there any net molecular dipole? No. Why not? <coughs> they cancel. Right, exactly. So we have bond dipoles, but no, <coughs> no molecular dipole. Hydrogen fluoride is a polar molecule. Carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. And then just for the sake of contrast, I think last time I put up sodium chloride and magnesium oxide. So we said they were ionic compounds. Now I've given us some electronegativities. And we have 1.0 for sodium, or rather 0.9 sodium and 3.2 for chlorine. And so this fits with our concept of greater than 2 electronegativity as an ionic compound. Same thing with magnesium oxide. Where magnesium, I said, was about 1.3 and oxygen was about 3.4, so it makes sense that it's an ionic bond. 
Later on in the class, you'll be encountering compounds where you have a bond between carbon and magnesium. These are a class of organometallic compounds called Grignard reagents. Organometallic compounds means compounds where you have carbon bound to a metal atom. And you can already tell me, is a Grignard reagent something like methyl magnesium bromide? Don't worry about the MGBR part. But is the bond between the methyl group, that's between the carbon, I'm already writing like an organic chemist here, we'll get to that in a moment. Is that a covalent bond or an ionic bond? Covalent. The electronegativity of carbon is 2.5, the electronegativity of magnesium is 1.3, it's less than about 2. So this would be a polar covalent bond. All right, let's try our hand with a real organic chemical. One of the smallest, aldehyde. I'll be good. I'll even draw in my lone pairs of electrons and so forth. Where have you heard of formaldehyde before? Biology. Do they still use it? It's, yeah. So formaldehyde was the classic compound for preserving specimens. It reacts with all sorts of groups like DNA cross-linked proteins, it kills bacteria. It's great at killing everything, including people. It's also carcinogenic, so the vapors are very bad for you. So nowadays substitutes are found. But it's a, one of the smallest organic compounds, and it's a nice example for starting with looking at bond dipoles and molecular dipoles in organic compounds. As a knee-jerk reaction at this point, most people in the room will probably know their electronegativities well enough to know, okay, all of the bonds in this molecule are covalent, not ionic. If we want to get a little more detail, we could say 3.4, 2.5, 2. Point, whoops, can't write today, 2.2. So we could say we would call this bond the CO bond a polar covalent bond. And the CH bonds, for all intents and purposes, are nonpolar covalent. The main bond dipole in the molecule is going to be the CO bond dipole. There are also a couple of small bond dipoles from the CHs. Not very important. But the overall result is that you have a net molecular dipole, like so, pointing from the pointing upward to the carbon yield.
We'll start with something easy and then get to something a little more confusing, maybe even spend some time chewing on it. So we'll start with the molecule carbon dioxide, CO2, the one that we've been drawing a couple of times now. <coughs> Remember how you do it, you pay attention only to the valence electrons in each atom. And we're going to see how many valence electrons all of the atoms bring to the table. And then we're going to try our best to arrange them so that everybody gets a complete octet. Because with the exception of hydrogen and sometimes elements like sulfur further down the periodic table, all of the elements want a complete octet. And again, with those exceptions, you can't put more than eight electrons around your, your atoms. You can't have a nitrogen with 10 electrons around it, for example. All right, so our oxygen brings six electrons to the table. And I'll just draw them like this. Our carbon brings four electrons to the table, and I'll draw them like this, dots to represent the electrons. Oh, <laughs> thank you, I only put five around the oxygen. And our other oxygen also brings six electrons to the table. All right, and then by whatever means we like, we can group those electrons. You can do this mentally. You can do this by drawing around them. I'll just gather them up in little circles here just to remind us that we're bringing these together. And then we can group them together and say, all right, here's our carbon. Maybe in the beginning of freshman chemistry, you would do it like this. Here are our oxygens. And I've drawn two pairs of electrons between the carbon and the oxygen, and two pairs between the carbon and the other oxygen, and two pairs of electrons on each oxygen. But certainly, after any short amount of time, you would now be drawing these structures like this, <coughs> saying, all right, that's going to, we're going to use our bonds. Each bond represents one electron. We'll draw our own pairs of electrons on the oxygen. If we're good, we might even try to put them sort of at 120 degree angles to represent the sp2 hybridization, although at this point that's not critical. There's our CO2 molecule. Now let's try something that's a little closer to the hearts of organic chemists. We'll try methanol, CH3OH. So now we bring to the table three H dot, three hydrogens, each with one electron. We bring together, we bring in a carbon with its four valence electrons. We bring in an oxygen with six electrons. And we bring in a hydrogen with its electron. And the first time you see, if you just say CH4O methanol, the first time you see it, you say, wait a second, how do I put all of those atoms together? <coughs> but after you start to hear these names, methanol, methyl alcohol, you realize, oh, there's a methyl group a CH3 group, 
and the Oxid and an alcohol group, NOH group. And we'll be coming back. Remember, I said there were three big concepts functional groups, curve arrow notation, and stereochemistry in organic chemistry. We'll be coming back to these functional groups in just a couple of chapters. So let's put all of these together to make our structure of methanol. Like so. And there's our structure of methanol, a full Lewis structure of methanol. After a short time, you're going to find you're writing these things like CH3OH and just taking as a given that, oh yeah, you could expand out the methyl group, but we're not going to bother with that. So this is really how organic chemists think about structure and bonding. All right, let's turn our example now, let's turn our attention now to a little bit harder example. Let's see if we can struggle through it. might think about is the idea, well, I understand I 
can form some bonds between my methyl groups and my sulfur. Then I still seem to have my oxygen. You look and you say, how do I, how do I put this all together? Connect the sulfur to the oxygen. The oxygen has six electrons. It just wants two more. So it's, it's happy. Connect the sulfur to the oxygen. <coughs> we'll have eight electrons. Around everybody. Everybody gets a complete octet. The sulfur could have extra electrons as well. We're going to come back to that notion, because this is a molecule that's nice to chew on. We're going to come back to that notion in just a moment when we get to the idea of resonance structures and the fact that many molecules can be represented better by more than one Lewis structure, and together those comprise a complete picture of the molecule. We're going to also chew on dimethyl sulfoxide as we talk about formal charges. So let's start and try to address the concept of formal charges. Another one, I think formal charges was in general chemistry. Yeah. So let's let's review what formal charges means, because this is actually important for organic chemistry. Formal charges for you. In cases of formal charges, 
parties where you're comparing apples and apples, elements in the same row in the periodic table, everyone having a complete octet, or everyone having to suffer and not having a complete octet. It's a simpler comparison. When you get between the second and third row, between carbon and phosphorus, or carbon and sulfur, or phosphorus and oxygen, or sulfur and oxygen, gets a little bit more complicated. Right now, what I will say is, for dimethyl sulfoxide, both of these resonance structures are correct pictures of the molecule. Together, we get a little bit more complete picture of the molecule. All right, let's start with formal charges because this will help lay, our, lay the grounds for discussing resonance structures. So formal charge really can be thought of as a bookkeeping mechanism. to keep track of where the charge is. Formal charges, 
our formal charge is a positive charge on the nitrogen. So let's try that same approach with dimethyl sulfoxide. I'll explode all of our bonds in this same way. And 
what the formal charge is and what importance there would be to them. That's a good one to think about on your own.
tricky one, and nobody's going to hold your feet to that your, the fire on it. The sulfur one's the one tricky one because the other rule that ends up fighting with that rule is that double bonds between rows, or particularly between the second row, of carbon, the oxygen, nitrogen row, and lower rows like sulfur and phosphorus and chlorine and, and bromine and so forth, are not very good. Yes, if you have, with all other things being equal, charge on a more electronegative atom is better. Other questions. These are actually really, really good questions, and they're really on the mark. And this is exactly the sort of question I hear people asking every year. So you are right on the mark in asking this. Um, where does the fifth nitrogen electron go? Where does the fifth nitrogen electron go? Well, they're all shared. So the nitrogens bring five electrons to the table. Your hydrogens, you'd actually put it together by bringing three hydrogens in and then bringing in a proton that doesn't have any electrons. <coughs> But the eight electrons in the ammonium ion end up being shared between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. Other questions? In the case of dimethyl sulfur, the question is how do you determine which resonance structure in dimethyl sulfoxide in the case of dimethyl sulfoxide, the good news is everybody gets a pass in this class because we have this two opposing rules fighting it out. As I said, the resonance structure with the separation of charges happens to be more important, but I wouldn't necessarily expect you to know that. And you will actually see people write it all the way. One last question. How do you show flow? We're going to come to curved arrows in the next lecture, and we will talk about how we can convert resonance structures. I want to show you one last resonance structure, a molecule that organic chemists love, and that molecule is benzene. Benzene was a real conundrum for organic chemists for many years of why it was so special. And you'll get to why benzene is so special in either the B or the C course. But for now, we're going to see just one special aspect of benzene. Benzene, of course, is C6, H6. The carbons and hydrogens are put together in a ring. Carbons are in a ring, the hydrogens are off the ring. We have alternating double and single bonds around the ring. And each carbon, oops, I've gone a little bit below the edge of the board there. Each carbon bears one hydrogen. And just as in the case of the acetate anion, benzene can be written by two equivalent resonance structures, one in which we have double bonds between these carbons here and single bonds between the other carbons, but then a second equivalent resonance structure Again, my, my bottom hydrogen has just gone a little bit below the blackboard there. And that second resonance structure alternates the double bonds in the other direction. And just as in the case of the acetate anion, it's not that we have a double bond on one side and a single bond on the other, or vice versa. It's that it's both of them at the same time all the time, and together, 
these two pictures make up a more complete structure of the Benzene Atomic All right, next time we will continue our discussion of structure and bonding, and we will move on to ideas of different types of structures and curved arrows.